So I call my youngest group. So I organize all my programs. It's all age and experience level. That's how I organize the different groups. And so my youngest, so think of it kind of like six to 10 years old, maybe 11 years old. We call it our fundamentals. And the reason I wanted to call it that is that I wanted to, to kind of open people's eyes that fundamentals is not what you think it is. And so when I think of the word fundamentals, I think of movement diversification. I think of creating an unlimited amount of movement problems, and I'm allowing the individuals to basically explore. It's called an affordance landscape. I want them to explore all these different movements, all these different situations, and allow them to kind of just feel it out and see what works, what doesn't work. And a lot of this stuff is through gameplay. And I do a ton, especially with my younger levels, I will say 99.9% .9 of the training process is it's all gameplay. And so think of it, it's like physical, physical education back in the 90s, but with common knowledge now. Um, and so uh, we'll use a ton of gameplay with that younger level. So you will not see kids doing kettlebell cleans. You will not be seeing kids doing cleaning jerks with a PVC dowel. You will not be seeing kids doing box jumps on the whistle. This is something where kids are coming in and I'm creating movement problems. You are listening to the Beyond the Scoreboard podcast, transforming athletes into leaders on and off the court with host Coach Furtado. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Beyond the Scoreboard podcast. Today, our guest of the day is Jamie Smith. Jamie is the founder and head sport preparation coach at the U of Strength with a background in sports medicine and exercise physiology from Merrimack College. Jamie blends physical preparation and skill adaptation to guide athletes from novice to elite levels, including NHL, NBA, and MLS players. His creative adaptive coaching helps athletes reach their full potential on and off the field. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Thanks for having me, coach. You got it. So let's give a little bit of context on the story of who you are and why you wanted to start the U of Strength. So share with us your um, basketball playing experience and, you know, what made you fall into kind of the CLA portion of strength and conditioning? Yeah, so I'll try to keep this short, but it's it's the typical story where it's like you fall in love. I had such a strong passion for the sport of basketball. And from a, you know, a genetic standpoint, I, I, I'm not designed to play basketball, but I was stubborn and it was just something that I was, honestly, I was obsessed with. And so, you know, played high school, uh, got an opportunity to play at the college level, um, didn't understand everything that I, that I know now. Um, and so that's one of the primary reasons why I decided to become a coach and an educator to kind of teach, you know, teach the athletes all of my mistakes and to learn from my mistakes. But I just, you know, constant overuse. And I basically blew up both, both knees at the same time and had uh, several surgeries within a very, very short time, five to be exact, within basically a year and a half. And I basically fell in love. I, I had no other option, really. It was either sit on my, you know, sit on my ass or be productive and do everything I can to try to, you know, kind of build myself back up. And so I fell in love with the weight room. And it was one of those things where, you know, I could be there 16 hours a day. And I just loved it. And at the time, uh, you know, Merrimack, I went to Merrimack College. Uh, it was a small division too. Now it's growing and it's expanding. And, you know, it's, it's really cool to see uh, the transformation to, to division one. But at the time it was, it was a very small small school. And I had three different strength coaches. Um, and the first two, they were good guys. Uh, and I wouldn't call them mentors, but they definitely got me interested in, you know, strength and conditioning. But the third guy who he's still there today, uh, Mike Kamal, uh, was a mentor of mine. And, and it, I basically, I would skip class. I would skip everything I could to just be in the weight room and just observe and, you know, just be a sponge. Um, and so it, I found, I found my second passion and, and, and then from there I could, I couldn't really bounce back. My knees were, were, I basically ruptured both my patella ligaments at the same time. And, and 
in today's knowledge, do, would I do things differently? Absolutely. And do I think I could have came back? Absolutely. But, you know, this was, you know, what, 18, 18 years ago, 20 years ago. So, um, so I, I was never able to get back on the court, but I was on to the next chapter, so to speak. And so from there, you know, I graduated, went into the private sector, had an opportunity, uh, which at the time I didn't realize how big of an opportunity, but I basically interned at, uh, at the University of Connecticut. And it was the year uh, that uh, we just, we had a ton of success. In season, we did not have a lot of success, but we ended up in the Big East, you know, it was that five days, five games, five wins, yes. and then that run straight through. And to, to experience, uh, I was 22 at the time, to experience a national championship mentality approach preparation, it was phenomenal. And it was one of those things that it was just, it will stick with me the rest of my life. Um, but I knew, I knew there was something more and I knew there was something, there was just something missing from, 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 you know, my coaching toolbox. And so I actually decided to go back into the private sector after, um, and that's basically when I opened up the U.S. Strength. I saw there was definitely a there there was definitely um, a a market where a lot of these a lot of these sport performance places are really fitness oriented, meaning it's everything is just getting kids tired or trying to a lot of you'll hear them it's it, it's it's like a factory kids in kids out. And I just disagreed with that mentality. I disagreed with that approach where it's like, if you look at sport practice and you look at, okay, these kids are trying to learn and adapt to all this, this, this variety of, of different skills. Why would we do things differently from a general perspective? And so that's where, when I opened up the U.S. strength, it was purely on athletic development, skill acquisition and motor learning. I don't work with like moms and dads. This isn't boot camp. This isn't, you know, a watered down version of a CrossFit class. This is specifically, I'm going to help you. And obviously depending on the age, but we are going to develop an unbelievable amount of skills that will help you and hopefully transcend outside the training environment. And so that's basically what I do today. It's, it's, it's anywhere from six years old you know, up to the professional level. And I work with all sports. I, I, I'm, I'm a huge sport junkie and I don't care if it's, if it's whatever, if it's downhill skiing, if it's volleyball, if it's basketball, if it's, you know, BMX riding, if it's skateboarding, I think that we can learn a lot from all of the different sports. And there's definitely sports, it's called donor sports where sports kind of, uh, they complement each other. Um, and so, I, I love, I, I work with a wide range of, of, of sports, of experience, backgrounds, but it's really with a, with a skill acquisition lens and a motor learning lens. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at today. Um, and the reason is that while all this had happened, so I had success at UConn, I then was transitioning back into the private sector, opening up my own, oh, my, opening up my own business. But then I also had a child. And I saw the growth, I saw the learning, I saw, you know, how this, you know, this young human being, this, the ultimate novice and how she was acquiring skills and how she was learning. And it just was fascinating. And so that's kind of when I, I went down the rabbit hole, you know, for, you know, whatever, this was eight years ago of really understanding, you know, ecological dynamics, you know, dynamical systems theory, constraints led approach not only in your pedagogy, I'm learning all of these theories, which are now the backbone to, you know, to my, my training program and how I approach working with athletes. A hundred percent. And there's, there's a lot of different directions we can go with that. And I appreciate all the context. Now, I think one of my things is like, I'm really kind of, I'm just beginning, like we kind of had talked about my constraint led approach skill acquisition journey i'm kind of into it like about a year and so like my my understanding i'm now comfortable and like confident with it and now one of my goals is bringing on guests like you you're on the athletic performance side of things and i think you brought up a really important point that even i'm trying to break my habits on the athletic performance side because i do do some weightlifting stuff but i come kind of from the traditional fitness side and i want to learn a little bit more so you talk about I think sport performance versus fitness. 
And can we like dive into a little bit more about that and what the difference is? Yeah. So, so fit and there's not the, the big thing, cause sometimes I can come off and, and I can go off on rants and I can really make, make the fitness size more almost like a, it's, it's a negative thing. And I don't want to come up. I don't want to come across like that, but when you have athletes, if you're, if you're, whatever, if you're a sport performance coach or an athletic performance coach, and that's what your that's what your that's what your product is. That is what your program where you're 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 telling kids, you're telling athletes, you're telling parents that we're going to do everything we can to complement and support whatever whatever is expected of you and whatever the require uh, the requirements are in sport. And so with fitness, it's it's literally it's just getting kids tired. It's uh, almost like a watered down version of what you would see in a boot camp class or a, you know, a CrossFit class. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. But to me, that's not sport performance. That's not, it's, it's, it's throwing the skill set out where it's all about just squatting, or it's all about how many sets am I doing? Or it's about, uh, you know, the number of repetitions I'm doing. And that stuff is important in a sense. But if there's a disconnect, where if a kid is doing a five by five squat program and what you're teaching him or her, there's a disconnect what they need to be doing on the court. I just think there's a better way to do it. And so the big, the big difference is that I try to make connections. So first thing is the power of language, right? And speaking a common language, speaking common. I'm, I'm really big on instead of, instead of teaching every single individual exact positioning or kind of this whole correct technical model, I teach concepts and principles. And the beautiful thing about this is that these concepts can be applied to a squat. They can be applied to a jump. They can be applied to a defensive stance. They can be applied to uh, uh, an offensive situation, whatever it may be. The concepts, what I try to do is I try to make connections and I use the word stickiness. I want the things that we do to be sticky. I want them to stay with you so that once you leave my four walls and you go into, you name the sport, these concepts will be with you. And they're a part of you. We call it the movement signature. Every kid has their own unique movement signature, right? And how how they're able to express that movement signature, they need to understand and respect some of these concepts from a health standpoint, from a longevity standpoint, and from a performance standpoint. And so that's where I think there's a disconnect. I think there's something, there's just, it, there's, it's, it's, something is missing where you'll hear strength coaches or you'll hear even sport coaches where it's like, all right, if you get stronger, you become a better player. And that's false. You can't say that. There's too many variables. There's too many constraints to say that if I get you stronger, that that's ultimately going to make you a better basketball player. Is it going to help you, especially the younger you are? Absolutely. But I don't like doing things. uh, And this is something I say to my athletes is like, I don't want to just, I don't want to be satisfied. I don't want to do things average. Everything we do, I want to be great. And I want to dominate. And so that's a, that's my approach where it's like, I could keep doing that. Just getting kids stronger and saying, Hey, my job is done. Sport coach is now your job to make them a better basketball player. But it's like, no, we can do more and we can help, you know, the basketball coach and we can be on the same page and both act, you know, as, you know, teachers, as guides, as facilitators, instead of it just being stay in your lane approach or, you know, this kind of traditional thing. Um, So that that's the biggest thing is that with the difference between kind of fitness training and more kind of motor learning, it's like I want to make connections. And that's just the biggest thing. And I don't care what the movement is. I want to have that connection piece. So now it's like, okay, I do this in a, in a, in a controlled, isolated, closed environment, but I also do it in, in a more chaotic, uncertain, open environment. And then the, we have that connection. We have that bridge where it's like, okay. And for some, it takes time, right? And so if you understand CLA and nonlinear pedagogy, learning does not happen in a, in a linear fashion. It's nonlinear. And that's one of the hardest things to tell a coach, to tell a parent, and to tell an athlete that 
you know, results don't happen on a pre-planned timeline. It, they just don't, especially during puberty, right? Because there's just so much change occurring. Um, but yeah, so that's this. Uh, the big thing is making that connection and trying to simplify, uh, simplify these concepts, these principles, you know, and make it age appropriate. A hundred percent. And so I would love to continue to expand on, can you give some examples of some of the concepts and principles and stickiness that you use um, with your athletes when you're teaching, you know, squat form or, or whatever it is? Yeah. So the, the biggest thing, and, and this, this is going to sound so simple, but it's, it, it's the truth, but you don't hear it, right? You don't hear it from a, a squat perspective, or you don't hear it from a deadlift perspective. But I talk about this idea of center of gravity management. In understanding the relationship between your base of support and your center of mass and how that relationship is everything. And so, like, real simple, under, understanding this whole center of gravity, you can apply this with, uh, with a simple trap bar deadlift, where just teaching kids, instead of reaching for the barbell, right, teaching kids, we use this idea of getting into the tunnel and understanding that when we get into the tunnel, there's some shapes. And so when I say the word shapes, that just means positions. There's some shapes that I want, I want to see. And everyone's how those final shapes are going to be a little bit different depending on the individuals. But when you get into that tunnel, you're going to see a full foot contact. You're going to see a flat back, right? You're going to see eyes are going to be kind of focused straight ahead, not down at the toes, right? And so you can take this whole center of gravity management, getting into the tunnel you know, uh, inside the weight room with say a deadlift or the bottom part of a squat, and then take that same thing in a deceleration pattern where you're doing a simple one V one mirroring and the repetition is finished in a, in a, in a, in a stop in a deceleration stance. And it's the same thing. You're getting into the tunnel. You're understanding that relationship between your base of support and your center of mass. Yes, now with it more of a deceleration, is there going to be more of a, instead of it being more symmetrical where the feet are kind of aligned, now maybe one foot's in front. So now we're getting into some of these split stances and stagger stances and some more, I call them asymmetrical stances. And then you can take that even further and get them into, you know, a 1v1 situation. And from a defensive perspective, if you don't know which way the person's going and you have a high center of gravity, you're going to be in trouble when you need to redirect or change direction. And so understanding that tunnel idea, again, just layering, making these connections and, and bridging the gap between a deadlift to a, you know, deceleration activity to a 1v1, you know, offensive or, or defensive situation. So that would be an, a, a very simple example. That makes a lot of sense. And so with that, I, I'm kind of a lot of my gears are, are running. When you're designing a performance session, how do you, how is it different, right? From a traditional, like, we're going to do these six exercises. We're going to do three sets, 10 reps of each. Oh God, that's a, that's a, okay. So obviously it's all age appropriate, right? And so, because I think context is important. So I apologize if this is a long answer. The younger you are, so this is one of my big things where you're here, you're here, you're, you're here coaches talking about master the fundamentals, right? And you'll hear, you'll see this, I mean, I mean, shoot, there were so many social media posts about USA basketball and mastering the fundamentals. And so the younger they are, so I call my youngest group. So I organize all my programs. It's all age and experience level. That's how I organize the different groups. And so my youngest, so think of it kind of like six to 10 years old, maybe 11 years old. We call it our fundamentals. And the reason I wanted to call it that is that I wanted to, to kind of open people's eyes that fundamentals is not what you think it is. And so when I think of the word fundamentals, I think of movement diversification. I think of creating an unlimited amount of movement problems and I'm allowing the individuals to basically explore. It's called an affordance landscape. I want them to explore all these different movements, all these different situations and allow them to kind of just feel it out and see what works, what doesn't work. And a lot of this stuff is through gameplay. And I do a ton, especially my younger levels. I will say 99.9% .9 of the training process is it's all gameplay. And so think of it, it's like physical, physical education back in the 90s, but with common knowledge now. Um, and so 
uh, will use a ton of gameplay with that younger level. So you will not see kids doing kettlebell cleans. You will not be seeing kids doing cleaning jerks with a PVC dowel. You will not be seeing kids doing box jumps on the whistle. This is something where kids are coming in and I'm creating movement problems. I'm creating game-like activities and I want them to just search and feel and just start that process, start that ownership process of mastering one's movement signature. But then as we get older, right? And as we're starting to get starting now we're, we're in the early stages of puberty to, you know, to the later stages of puberty. But as we start to get older, then I'm going to start to, I'm going to start to introduce more traditional and I'm giving air quotes, more traditional concepts like, or traditional activities, like let's say a, a dumbbell bench press or a goblet squat or a trap bar deadlift. But with those movements, I'm still filling it in with game-like activities. So for one example, for our, so we have the fundamentals, which is our youngest, and then we have our foundation level. Think of that. That's like 11 to 14, 12 to 14 years old. All right. I'm introducing, let's just say, a, a trap bar deadlift. But we're, instead of pairing that, right, and so you'll see that with a lot of sport performance places, they'll do a, a deadlift pattern with some sort of upper body push. Or they'll do, you know, a squatting pattern with some sort of upper body pull. What I do is I'll do the traditional movement, but then I pair that with a game-like activity. But with that game-like activity, I'm very targeted with what type of, what is the objective? What is the skill that I want to emerge where that we can, we, we can take that skill, we can take that, uh, whatever the objective is, and kind of translate transfer that to other skills and other activities we're doing. So for example, we might pair a deadlift with a with a dunk like game where I'm trying to teach I'm trying to teach jumping we're trying to teach directional force application whether that's more of a vertical focus like a dunk like game where they need to basically come up with different ways to dunk on a makeshift hoop or maybe they need to dunk um, a heavy med ball and we have a partner holding a a ring and we change how high that partner is holding that ring maybe that partner's standing on a 12 inch box Maybe that partner's standing on a 30-inch box and the, and the individual has to take a 10-pound med ball and dunk that ball. So in order to that, for that to happen, they need a ton of ver vertical force application. They need to understand, you know, some of these kind of jumping concepts. So that's an example where we'll take a traditional movement and then we'll pair that with an unorthodox activity, like a game-like activity, whether it's a dunk whether it's some of our diving, diving and catching activities, uh, whether it's some of our roughhousing, that's a big one I don't see in, in athletic development is, is promoting roughhousing and doing some of these battling and perturbation-based activities. Uh, so that would be an example of how I blend tradition with kind of unorthodox. But then that doesn't stop there because then as we get older, you know, there's a misconception that games aren't for 21 year olds, 19 year olds, 30 year olds, some of these athletes. I mean, I've had some athletes that have been with me since the start, you know, this is year nine or actually year 10, uh, in my new facility, in, in, in the, in my facility I'm in now, and we're still playing games. How I use those games might be a little bit different where we might use them more as a warm up. And I don't use the word warm up. I use the word pre-training because I think when you, when you, when you tell a kid, okay, it's time to warm up. It's always that like, oh crap, I don't want to warm up. Shoot, I still train. I still do things on a daily basis and I hate warming up. So we've kind of changed the whole mentality where no, this is pre-training. This is, this, is, this is not just eight to 10 dynamic warm up movements. This is something we're going to be very specific. We're going to be very targeted and we're going to do everything we can to prepare the brain, the foot and the rest of your body. Um, so we'll use games at the beginning. But we also use games at the end. And so we call these our reboot activities. And so what I have found is that especially with, say, say it's an 18-year-old uh, senior in high school and they've been training for, you know, since they were in sixth grade. Um, so their nervous system is, is, is actually pretty developed from a training standpoint. When you think about it, if they have seven years of training, their nervous system is developed, it's, it's wired and it's developed a certain way. And so we will lift them. We will train heavy and slow. We will train light and fast. We, we, we utilize all those tools 
from a resistance training standpoint. But what I have found is that with the heavier resistance training or the slower movements, there are what I call negative consequences to those movements, meaning there's a promote, uh, it promotes muscle slack, a down regulation of, of the neural system. So think of like coordination and reflexive base patterns. And so we will use games to reboot or recalibrate some of these qualities, some of these elasticity, reflexes, hand-eye coordination, et cetera. We will utilize the games at the end after we train. And so that's just some examples to understand from youngest to oldest, how we kind of mix tradition with outside the box, you know, activities. No, I, I like that a lot. And I think that's definitely something that, that we can take away for our programs and pairing them with a, a traditional, right, exercise with a you know game. so crazy, they... and I'm sorry to cut you off, but when it was, no, you'll go. see this too. You will see if you do a deadlift with, let's say, some sort of jumping game, that deadlift, how they, how they learn, and let's just say purely, I'll dumb it down, they will get stronger because what is happening in that gameplay environment is that they, we have all these neurotransmitters. We have all of these things happening inside our brain that's going to allow them to learn and then be able to express whatever you're trying to teach them in the deadlift or squat pattern or the bench press pattern. And so I have found from a, from a skill acquisition standpoint, it is phenomenal. And for purely from a performance standpoint, getting kids stronger, right? It, it's not that hard, right? When you get a 12 year old, they're going to get stronger every session, but are they able to get stronger and be able to demonstrate that strength across a variety of contexts? I think that's a whole nother question. And so by simply just pairing those take those two together, I've had a ton of success. I like that a lot. And I think one thing I want to kind of follow up on is you touched on a little bit is the idea of warming up versus pre-training. Um, because obviously that's one of the things that is super ingrained into sports, whether it's a basketball practice or, you know, strength and conditioning practice. What is, you know, like, I'm sure you get a lot of pushback, you know, it's like, it's good to have consistent eight to 10, you know, that's a, a way to, to regulate them. So what's your kind of response to that? Because that this is something that I want to explore. Absolutely. And I hope that you give me kind of the ideas uh, on how to implement it. Yeah. Yeah. So I get a lot of pushback. Right. Uh, um, and that's fine. I, 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 I can handle it because again, I'm not, I'm not just saying things to say it. Right. I'm not just saying it to, to promote something. I'm not just saying it. I'm just seeing what what's happening in the moment at the U.S. strength. And I'm just spreading. I'm just sharing. That's it's really that simple. And so I just looked at the pre-training uh, or the, let's, let me take a step back. I looked at the warm up very similar where it's like, all right, we're going to do the same thing. All right. And then we're just going to move on. And then we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of the training session. You'll hear that a lot. We'll get into the fun stuff of the training session. And it's like, okay, we're going to spend the first 15 to 20 minutes and we're just going to waste time and we're just going to fill time. From a business owner perspective, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Every second counts. And, when, and from a learning standpoint, you only have so much time. These kids have only so these kids only have so much uh, energy reserves and attentional capabilities. Time is precious, right? And especially working with the youth, especially working with some of these kids that can't sit still for two seconds. So that's where I kind of, I just opened, I was like, all right, how can we be more productive? How can we change the perspective of the first, let's just say first 15 minutes of a session is, is something to look forward to. Is something that is actually we are getting something out of it, or kids are excited to 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 do it. And so the big thing I already talked about is utilizing gameplay. Um, we do a ton of stuff, so I'll just give some some actionable uh, ex uh, ideas. And so we do a lot of stuff with the foot. Uh, we do a lot of sensory overload, sensory input to the foot. Where one thing I have found with especially with younger athletes is that a lot of these kids. They don't go outside as much as, let's say, like me and you did when we were growing up. Uh, they don't do stuff barefoot. Uh, so they're, just their foot awareness alone 
is very poor. If the foot awareness is a poor, what's that going to do to your relationship between your center of gravity and your, to your center of gravity and basis support? Everything's going to be thrown off. And so that's a big thing we do is we get kids out of their shoes right away. And we get them rolling on spiky balls. We get them rolling on, we have different types of rocks, rock mats. Uh, we get them walking on different types of PVCs. We have PVCs filled with sand, PVCs filled with water, thin and thick PVCs, long and short, straight and curved. We have all these different sensory uh, inputs for the foot. So that is one of the very first things we get kids out of their sneakers and we just get their foot exposed, you know, to different, to different surfaces. Um, so that's a big thing. The other thing is, is, you know, getting into the tapping into their brain. And so that's where the gameplay is huge. Um, but we do a lot of stuff with isometrics. And so isometrics uh, is a fancy way of, of just saying it's static training, where you're basically holding certain positions, but it's not yoga. It's not static stretching. You're holding certain positions to generate positional awareness, but to also con connect, connect your body to your brain and tap into the nervous system where you will see through isometrics, there's going to be neural benefits that can be transferred on to jumping, landing, cutting, sprinting, et cetera. And so we will utilize isometrics and we have, and I try to share as much as I can. We have a ton of, and depending on the age, depending on the level, we have so many different types of isometrics that, um, uh, that we use. It can be as simple as just holding a athletic stance, a jump stance, and a single leg stance for like our really young level athletes. And once they can, can control, say for 10 seconds, they can control the stances. They're, they're not off balance. They're not breaking shapes. Uh, they, they can focus on a specific, you know, visual, uh, some sort of visual tool. Then we'll start to layer in maybe just simple playing catch where your task is you're trying to keep two feet in contact with the ground. You're trying to stay in the tunnel, but you, you need to get 20 passes with your partner. Or maybe we're adding roughhousing where they got to stay on two feet and they got to do the same exact thing. But now they're holding a, a dowel or a noodle up in place. And the partner is adding perturbations where they're trying to get them off balance. They're trying to break those positions. So we do stuff like that. We will do a ton of different isometrics uh, to tap into the brain. Um, but then there's also, I mean, I don't know how crazy you want to get into this, but then we will, we will go into, uh, you know, we call it landing prep. And so this is part of the pre-training part of the warm up. We, we do different things where we're focusing on deceleration, pre-tensioning and understanding what, right before the foot collides with the ground, what is your body doing? What type of shapes? What are you feeling? And so we do a ton of landing prep activities where we will pair that with a partner. And so now we have all the benefits from the landing prep from a physical standpoint. But now let's say we're adding a partner where you say you have to mirror that partner. Let's just say really simple. Both people in, are, uh, are basically uh, uh, an arm's length away. They're doing some in-place ankle jumps. And then one of them has to drop into a double leg or sing, single leg landing stance. And the, the opponent has to mirror that situation, has to mirror that strategy. And so now we're tapping in not only the physical, but now we're tapping into the psychological and it's called the perceptual motor landscape. And so now we're, 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 we're kind of killing two birds with one so stone, so to speak. And so that's, that's another example. We'll do our landing prep. We'll do a ton of different one V ones where we use constraint of the CLA where we're, it's not crazy, it's not random, it's very, it's very targeted, meaning we might do a 1v1 situation that only affords acceleration type movements. We might create a 1v1 that only affords crawling type patterns. We might do 1v1s that only afford change of direction type patterns, stuff like that. And so, but going through this, as you can see, this isn't a warm up, right? There's a lot of different components, different aspects to it. So we call that the pre-training because the last activity, I want it to be a seamless transition or what we call, we want to bridge. We want to have a nice bridging activity so that when we get into our speed, our agility, our more, uh, I don't want to say advanced, but our more uh, targeted gameplay environments, it's a nice, easy transition. Or, and I do this a lot, uh, I, have, I work with a ton of different soccer, basketball, and lacrosse programs. 
they can go right into sport practice. And the feedback I get from the coaches is that there is no waste of time. When those kids get on the ice, get on the court, get on the field, they are ready to go. The coach doesn't need to take five minutes, 10 minutes to get kids organized, get them in lines, you know, on the whistle doing this. Their brains, their bodies are firing and ready to have a great practice. 100%. There's a lot there. And I think I have a couple of follow up questions that I'm going to get to here in a second. But before I get to that, I feel like, you know, some of the pushback I've got in terms of the sport performance is, you know, people talk about the CLA. Oh, it's playing games. They play games all the time, right? Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's lazy coaching. But I feel like what you're talking about right now, I feel like it takes a lot of real time, obviously, in, in learning just all the skill acquisition stuff that you've t- touched on. But yeah. to be so intentional about the pre-training, the muscles we're going to work on and then how we're going to pair that. Like, I feel like that's a lot of work. So can you talk about how kind of your process of building out like a athletic performance session, like the preparation that goes into it? A lot. It's a yeah. lot. And that's a thing when, and I, I, t- I do take it personal when, when I hear coaches saying it's a free for all, it's lazy coaching. I hear the same stuff, but they don't see the, the unlimited amount of, hours that I watch video. So we record everything, right? right? I have two, I have two phones and I, it's nothing fancy. I'm a one man shop. I don't have yep. deep pockets. I have two iPhones that I have 70,000 videos on both phones <laughs> that yeah. at the end of every nice. session, whether I have 50 videos or I have 200 videos, I'm going over every single video. I am treating this like you would in sport. Just like you would do after practice or after a game with video analysis and looking, how can I make our training, our practice more productive and more efficient? And so I take that same approach and I don't know why this seems like this is, you know, a crazy idea, but I do the same thing for strength and conditioning. And I just don't know. It's uh, it, it, to me, it's, it, it's, I feel like the other way is lazy. The other way of, okay, I'm going to write a, a 16 week periodized program. And then my job is done. And then I'm just going to hoot and holler and yell and slap people on the back. And my job is done. Sorry, that is bullshit. That, that is lazy. Where if you look at every single session, I, and I'm not, this is not, I am telling the truth. I look at every repetition as a learning opportunity. Every single rep we do, I don't care if it's when a kid enters my weight room. I am very, very strategic with how I interact with that individual. Do I greet that individual? Do I take a step back and do I just observe that individual? Two, okay, how are we performing? Where are your feet in this squat pattern? Are they, are they wider? Are they narrow? Are they closer? Are, are we going to do more of an asymmetrical stance compared to a symmetrical stance? How are we holding the barbell? How are we holding the dumbbell? What is the tempo of the repetition? Are we going really slow today in the eccentric portion? Are we pausing certain portions in the isometric for an isometric? Or are we trying to blast out and focusing on the concentric? There's all these little details, but this could not be done if I didn't have all these videos. I didn't have this database as well as the relationship with the athletes and the youth athletes I work with. It's, it's a partnership. And it's understanding, having that transparency and understanding that it's like, okay, I have an objective in every single session we do. We have themes, we have objectives, we have uh, things that we want to emphasize, but it can change. It's not written in stone. And so that's, that's, that's one of my big, you know, one of my big concepts where it's like, all right, if it doesn't feel right or you don't understand it, then let's change it. Let's figure out a way that you can grasp this concept. You can feel these different shapes um, and I don't care how it's done. Right. And it's as long as it's meeting what we're trying, what the objective is, I don't care. And so that's a thing we call them. We call these training menus where we build out, you know, the younger they are, the less options they have. They might have option A and option B. But then let's say I have a kid that's been training eight, nine, 10 years. They might have unlimited amount of options where as long as if it's a weight room or, or if it's out in the field with some sort of acceleration or curved acceleration, you know, activity, as long as we're hitting what we're the objective, I don't care how or what we do. Uh, and so that's, that's something that's foreign to a lot of, you know, traditional places. Um, but my, my biggest suggestion is start small and that's what I do. Make one change. 
make one change, start one thing. I, I went with the warm up, and my first change was basically changing it to the pre training. And within that pre training, I got rid of foam rolling, I got rid of static stretching, I got rid of all the initial stuff we do. And I said, okay, what are the real important things that when kids come in, what is missing from their, from their life, from their day to day? What are they not getting? And a lot of times it's they're in shoes. Their brain is not stimulated, stimulated in a way that is conducive for athletics and they don't have fun. And so those three big things, those three things are what we do at the beginning of session. And that's really important. Um, you know, that's important for all, all levels, all, you know, uh, all genders. It doesn't matter. Sport is a game. And I think especially the younger you are, it is a game. And I think a lot of coaches forget that. And it should be fun. It should be engaging. It should be, uh, it should be considered learning. But for a lot, it's not. 100%. I feel, yeah, I feel like the, the through line I heard from all of that is it's, it's every rep you need to be learning, right? And, and it's about learning and growth and development. And I find that the CLA is so much more engaging for players, right? Because you're, and, and like you said, right, the, there's so much more time that goes into it because of all the different variables we're, we're navigating. And so my kind of final question for you will be, um, you know, number one, where can people find and follow you because you do post a lot of great content and then where can also people continue to learn about a lot of the the different topics you talked about skill acquisition differential differential learning uh constraint led approach all that good stuff um and, and any final parting words um for the coaches and parents that are listening yeah absolutely so first of all thank you i appreciate this opportunity this 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 was awesome um yeah, so I post a lot uh, with our socials, right, at the U of Strength. Um, and so that's basically Instagram, X, um, and YouTube. Uh, so I po I try to post – I try to make it a, a, almost like a daily habit where I want to share one, one piece of information. Just one thing that I observed that I saw that, uh, that I think could be beneficial for one person, not a million – not 2 million. I want one coach to take that and be like, huh, get them to just rethink whether they agree or disagree with it at the end. I just want to get one individual to just rethink and say, hey, okay, why is he doing this? How is he doing this? And can we make this work for our situation? And so that's, that's what I strive. I, I, I post on a daily basis and it can be as simple as, you know, whatever, something in the warm up something, you know, more advanced with some sort of, you know, force development method that I'm trying out or, you know, some of these non-traditional things. And that's what I really try to do. I try to share a lot of the stuff that is missing, right? With these small sided games, with the CLA, uh, with understanding, you know, plyometrics and some of the kind of misconceptions out there uh, with, you know, you know, some of these tools. Um, so yeah, on all my so socials, uh, the U strength, uh, and then on my website too. Um, so I basically share, I have several different, uh, resources. Um, I have a bunch of different eBooks. I have a membership page and I have a bunch of different templates that are updated. I try to update them as much as I update within our facility. I try to stay up to date with all the resources that I, that I offer. And it's just everything that we shared. You know, I'm just, I'm trying to share in a, in a digital way, in a video way, in a written content way, because I just see what it's doing with the app, the, the, the small amount of athletes I get to work with. I just, I'm hoping to, to reach, you know, more and help more. Um, and then, yeah. And then if anyone's got questions, uh, the U of strength at gmail.com reach out. I'm open to any kind of conversation, you know, whether you disagree or you're confused, or you're like, hey, this does make sense, but I'm a little a little intimidated where I don't know if I can make this work. I promise you, you can. It's really, if you start simple, you make one change, and you listen to the athletes, and the last thing, you put your egos aside, you know, good things will happen. I love that. Thank you so much for your time today, Jamie. I'm definitely going to take these couple of pages of notes. I'm going to make sure that we're at BTG basketball. We're going to be looking at y'all's resources for our weightlifting sessions. So I, I appreciate your time today. Thank you.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Beyond the Scoreboard podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure that you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and share it with a friend, coach, or parent you feel like would get value from this episode. It's our responsibility to impact as many parents and coaches who are the ones that are impacting our athletes. That's how we create a ripple effect. So thank you for being a part of our community, and we look forward to serving you all next week.